Hi everyone and welcome back. I don't know what that little jazz hand was, but I am just quite excited to be back. I've got this new fringe. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure on it, but I do. I think I love it. I think I love it. I've decided to go in a slightly different direction with the channel. I've obviously had quite a bit of time off. I've not been that consistent uploading and part of that was because I was finishing my MA which is all done and dusted and part of it is also just because I wasn't really sure the direction that I wanted to take with my channel but I've decided that I think what I'm going to do now is do reviews mainly not not only but mainly focus on the literature side of witchcraft and magic and all that stuff because my degree was actually in English Lit so it just makes sense to me completely to actually focus on that side of it because I know that I'm good at that. That can be fiction, it can be non-fiction, it can be academic or poetry or you know anything and I mean I've got a bookshelf full, well like three bookshelves full of it so <laughs> I'm gonna kind of go through my collection but if there's anything that you'd like to see me review then just leave it in the comments below and I will do my best. And yeah, today you know by the title that I am reviewing this, The Book of English Magic, and that's by Philip Cargom and Richard Hergate. It's a really exciting one is this. Philip Cargom was actually the head of Obod, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. Uh, I don't know if he still is or if it's passed over, if he's handed it over now. I think it was um, in the process of being handed over, but I don't know if it's actually gone yet. God, my nose is really itchy, I keep touching it. So yeah, we're reviewing The Book of English Magic and spoiler alert, this is one of my favourite books at the minute. I've kind of fallen completely in love with it. So this is going to be a pretty positive review to kind of kick us off. So really the goal for this series is going to be to inspire you and to hopefully find books you may not have known about before and also to find books that I've never heard of before from the comments from people. I've written a bit of an essay and it's kind of on my computer just below so I'm going to be looking down quite a lot in this video um, and I can only apologise for that but it is what it is. So it's in total 540 pages long which is pretty big as you can see and that means that it's really really nice and in-depth I mean it's obviously a very ambitious work the book of English magic uh, and yeah it's clearly very well researched it's written by someone who has loads of experience within not just druidry um, but within you know magic and academia and all that kind of thing so yeah he's a really reliable person um, is Philip Cargom. So the book begins with a preface and the preface says the book of English magic explores the curious and little known fact that of all the countries in the world England has the richest history of magical law and practice. English authors such as J.R.R. Tolkien, Terry Pratchett, Susanna Clarke, Philip Pullman and turf extraordinaire J.K. Rowling dominate the world of magic in fiction but while children accept the magical world without reservation, most adults are not only sceptical of its place in modern society, but are ignorant of the part magic and ma magic and magicians have played in English history. And I really love this because within Britain, it's you'll probably know this if you're from Britain, but it tends to be Scotland, uh, Ireland and Wales that are renowned for having a really rich magical and uh, mythological heritage. England kind of gets left behind a little bit in the British Isles. Yeah, I don't know, it's just not seen as having that rich Celtic history that the other places have. So it's really nice that someone's finally kind of flying the flag for English magic. And that's what attracted me to this book actually in the first place, uh, because there's so much that's centred on Celticism which is amazing and there were Celts in England but it's just not quite the same, England's not a Celtic country. Yeah, I don't know, I just enjoy the fact that it roots me to the, the actual place that I live which, yeah, rather than just being slightly out of reach, like just up in Scotland or just in Ireland, you know, yeah. So I'll try and insert uh, some footage of this but just after the preface he includes a magical map of England and this um, contains 
loads and loads of magical places that will be really, really interesting to visit. So we've got places like uh, Pendragon Castle, Mother Shipton's Cave, Pendle Hill, which is somewhere that I uh, saw when I was a child all the time. We always used to drive past it and my mum always used to point it out and say, oh, the Pendle Witches, oh, Pendle Hill. Um, the White Horse of Uffington and Dragon Hill. And of course, Stonehenge, uh, the Witchcraft Museum. Yeah, uh, and there's loads of others. So this would actually be really cool, I think, to plan sort of a road trip around England and go to all the magical places. Uh, and that's something I definitely intend to do when I finally learn to drive. And then on the page after that, we've got a magical map of London. And on this, we have Treadwell's bookshop. So it says here in the introduction, our story begins in a bookshop. Treadwell's in London's Covent Garden is everything a bookshop should be. Warm, inviting, comfortable. And yet most people hurry past it because it specialises in a subject they don't believe in, magic. And then we have a nice, fairly concise introduction um, with a few pictures, photographs um, of interesting oh, people and parties. What I really like in this book is that he does include a lot of fiction. And I really like this because it indicates a lack of snobbery. Because I think a lot of particularly academic witchy people don't like fiction such as Harry Potter, I've seen it all over Facebook as well and things like that, like social media. They don't like Harry Potter because it's not real magic, it makes people think that magic's just fantasy, that it's silly, but I love um, historical fiction, particularly when magic's involved. And I love, well I love any fiction when magic's involved, I'm, yeah, I just, oh. And I think that the mundane realm that we live in and the other world and the fantasy world of the imagination all inform each other they're all so interconnected within and without the human psyche that it's kind of impossible to actually separate them i think it's ridiculous to try so i think they're all completely intertwined and i love that he um, reflects that in this book so here it says, what is magic? And he actually gives a quote from Susanna Clark um, from her book, The Ladies of Grace, Adieu. And she also wrote Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is another very hefty but amazing book, which is definitely worth a read if you like magical historical fiction. And the quote is, magic, madame, is like wine. And if you are not used to it, it will make you drunk. Which is just a nice, <laughs> a nice little quote. The book is then split into 12 chapters and we're going to focus on chapter 1 which is called Ancient Roots and Magic Wands, Caves and the Hidden Treasure of the Land. Most of the chapters in this book, pretty much all of them, follow the same kind of structure. So we'll just use the first chapter as a bit of a case study and then I'll show you a few key parts from the rest of the book and what I think about them and anything I don't like and yeah, that'll do. So chapter one, ancient roots and magic wands. He says, there are now more practicing wizards in England than at any other time in her history. And again, I really love this because it's kind of like, whenever we think of like a magical world, we always, or at least I do, think of this like pseudo medieval um, land where there's like, little witches living on the outskirts of town and wizards assisting the king and like uh, dragons flying hither and yon and yeah but you know it's actually quite nice to know that to see that we are actually living in the golden age of magic so we don't need to fantasize and um, feel sad that we're not living in a time like that or you know hark back with rose tinted glasses at like the medieval time where there were people practicing folk magic because actually to see a magical world all you need to do is just look out the window and i really really like that because this is the golden age of magic and we should be so grateful that we live in this time i think it's awesome so yeah that's a really nice way to start this book i think 
so he <laughs> well that was a weird um so he begins each chapter with a bit of an introduction to the theme and he goes into a lot of detail so here he's talking about the um five caves at Cresswell Crags and he says 12,000 he says the evidence of paintings in these caves dated to 12,000 years ago shows that by then they were being decorated and used for magical ceremonies and he then links that to some caves in France and I think some in Spain as well yeah and it really kind of puts it into historical context and it just it's just incredibly well researched he's talking about the White Horse of Uffington and Dragon Hill and when he's describing these places he says despite the sprawling towns and ugly massive roads that blight the landscape you can walk on pathways that are thousands of years old and that run from one ancient magical site to another etc etc and when he's describing it you really do get the sense that he's been there and you he will have definitely been there because it's a very famous place um, in England but you get that, that sense with everywhere that he describes in this book. It really seems like it's written by someone who's practically done like all of it and been everywhere. And it's really, you feel like you're in safe hands with him as an author. Another thing that I really like that every chapter has, going back to fiction, is they have a read about this period in fiction section. I don't know, I'll hold it up and see if I can, the light's a bit bright. That box there um, is a read about this period in fiction section. And he's recommended two books, Green Man by Henry Treese and Mythago Wood by Robert Holtstock. And I just absolutely love that. And he's got that in every section. And I think that's just absolutely brilliant. I also find that he actually breaks down each chapter really nicely. So it's not too overwhelming. It's really easily digestible. And he'll have the introduction and then small sections about each thing that he um, brings up in the introduction he'll have the read about this period in fiction section so next he's got two key figures and he's written basically a, a mini biography of each one so we've jo got john aubrey and william stuckley and then we have a section on ley lines and this section which i also like begins with three centuries after aubrey and stuckley alfred watkins a landscape photographer in herefordshire uh, noticed that ancient sites seem to be aligned with others nearby and that three centuries after just really helps to give you that sense of time and it shows that the the way that he set it out is really effective in terms of dealing with such a vast history because it seems like an almost impossible task but he's broken it down in such a digestible way that it actually is really easy to follow and you don't feel overwhelmed reading this book at all. So then we've got a uh, character study, well not character study, but a little biography thing on Alfred Watkins and then we have John Mitchell. And now we get to another thing that I really really like about this book and it's the fact that he completely encourages you to actually go out there and do things. And I think that's so important because, you know, you read a book like this and you think, oh, you know, it's academic. You can sit in your cosy armchair and read it and it's amazing. But it also actually really encourages you to start doing things. So here we have a section called how to hunt for ley lines. It tells you all the equipment that you need. It gives you little quotes that encourage you to do it and make it seem really, you know, magical and inspiring. And it tells you exactly how to do map work, things to look out for. It even tells you what kind of pencil you should use. You know, it's like so detailed. Uh, recommends books for you. It's split into map work and field work. So you do um, the map work at home and then you can actually go out and trips through fields and look for ley lines. Like I was saying before, um, how it's clear that he's done most of these things. It's, or at least it really feels like he has. He he kind of litters little tips and tricks throughout which i find incredibly helpful so it says here although lay hunting can be undertaken at any time of the year in the winter the undergrowth will have died back so that you're more likely to spot a significant looking old stone hiding under foliage and it's just very indicative of someone who knows and he also which i found fascinating um advises you to Look at the old tithe maps which were drawn up at the time of the Enclosure Acts between 1750 and 1860, which may give you the names of old tracts that have now disappeared. 
which is just again really good advice so if you're struggling it kind of takes it a little bit further and that's the final phase which is research work and I just absolutely love that I love taking sort of these traditions that you read about and then actually just doing them in the real world I just I love it and then he adds a section on dousing and here we come to the only thing that I don't like about this book and I don't know if you I mean the the light will make it I'll try and pop in some footage but the fact that I don't know it literally looks like there's nothing on that page like underneath this very short introduction bit here like this for some reason this book is littered with stories actually from people who've written them who are key figures within uh, each each chapter so here we have a douser's story so we've got peter taylor um, we've got later on the lady who um, started treadwell's bookshop i think we've also got professor ronald hutton uh, but in order to separate them they've put their sections in like a light gray ink which makes it i mean i'm in studio lighting now and i can read it fine but if you're reading it in low lighting or like in bed with like a bedside lamp you're gonna strain your eyes trying to read this and it's really frustrating because it's all really interesting stuff but most of the time when i read i'm not in studio lighting and it, it just strains my eyes a bit i don't know so that's just a pet peeve of mine with this and it's really annoying but just read it in the daylight in good lighting and you'll be fine i, I don't think it's enough to not buy the book and um, i don't know what the kindle version's like so if you've got a kindle then you could get it on there and you'll be able to like adjust your settings and stuff so that might be a better option anyway moving on we'll go on to something um a little bit better now another section on how to so we've got a how to douse section and he shows you how to make angle rods how to make um, or locate v-rods on young trees, how to make pendulums, how to use pendulums on a map, uh, how to use the v-rods and then <laughs> if that's not enough for you there's a section called going deeper. So yeah and, how to, and here he talks about combining lay hunting with dousing and it's just like it's just incredibly detailed it's <laughs> amazing and when you think that this is just one chapter out of 12 it's you know you get a lot for your money in this book you really do and we've not finished the chapter yet so then he has a section called traps for the sorcerer's apprentice and in this i really like the fact that he seems although he's very wrapped up in the mystical magical world he's very um kind of level-headed and non-sentimental about things he he's very kind of practical and sensible and here he says the most sensible approach to ley lines and to dousing seems to lie in being open-minded and unattached to any particular theory because he was saying how some people that are interested in ley lines are interested in it from kind of an archaeological standpoint and just find it interesting and unusual that these um, monuments kind of seem to align for like uh, they're not really sure why and did ancient people do it for a reason and then there's people that take it to a more spiritual place so yeah it, when he says um, you know be open-minded and unattached to any particular theory it's again encouraging you to think for yourself go out for yourself and just yeah just have fun with it you know even if uh, there's no scientific evidence that it's definitely real you know it's no harm in doing it if you find it fun and i just like that i do and as if that wasn't enough at the end we have a things to do section where he just uh, lists bullet points of uh, different things to do that pertain to the section so or the chapter sorry uh, join a group um, such as the society of lay hunters go lay hunting learn dousing try and find a crop circle he recommends some maps to get and then the very very end of the chapter is the resources section i love how it's laid out so these themes are the ancient landscape lay hunting and dowsing which means that if 
only one of those subjects interested you, you can immediately and very easily just go straight in and find a book that pertains to the very specific interest that you are interested in. <laughs> and I, yeah, I just love how that's laid out. I think it's very accessible, very easy to find, split into books and websites and yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea and to have it a separate one for each chapter as well. I think it's just brilliant. So that's the basic layout of each chapter and I think it's really, again, accessible and you don't feel like you have to sit down and read the whole book um, front to back and I probably wouldn't recommend it. And this book really lends itself for that dipping in and out approach. Lends itself for? Lends itself to. So in the next chapter, which is called The Magicians Organise Themselves and uh, The World of the Ancient Druid, there's a table which has all the Celtic tree um there we are, letters and the Irish name and then the tree that it corresponds to uh, within it and then loads of information about uh, the Druid tree law and I actually used this table a lot when I was doing my MA. Um, my tutor, I don't think I've said, my tutor lent me this, um, a copy of his copy of this book and I was just obsessed with it and I got so carried away that I ended up scribbling all over this section because <laughs> I forgot that it wasn't mine um, yeah but anyway sorry Steve but yeah I, I use this a lot and I cross referenced it with The White Goddess by Robert Graves um, and yeah it was a, made a very very fascinating study and he actually talks on the page opposite about The White Goddess um, does Philip so just so much information um, loads of section on druid herb law and C.S. Lewis section uh, yeah so interesting chapter 3 is called Star Cunning and Wordcraft the world of the Anglo-Saxon sorcerer oh, and I love Anglo-Saxon magic I am um, sorcery and I'm also a massive Lord of the Rings fan and Tolkien was kind of very um, inspired by Anglo-Saxon beliefs uh, for his Middle Earth so yeah there's a lot about that in this section and there's I think there's even a section on yeah <clears throat> a little biography of Tolkien and a picture of the King Kingmaw ring which clearly um, inspiration for the one ring it talks about yeah, Anglo-Saxon magic, spells and charms, uh, and the read about this section in fiction, the way of word, um, is yeah all about um, re-establishing Saxon magic, and I really want to read that. I keep forgetting to get it, and, and I just need to read it. And they've got a whole section about that as well, and a little picture of the King Maw ring. There, I don't know. Can you see it? I think. Just the best section ever and I'm getting a bit carried away actually looking at it now so let's move on. The Matter of Britain, so that's um, Arthurian everything. Merlin, King Arthur and the Search for the Holy Grail. And that's chapter three? No? Four? Yeah. So this has obviously got a section on um, T.H. White, Marion Zimmer Bradley and obviously he talks about Geoffrey of Monmouth and Thomas Mallory and all those of course um, Coretia and Detroit I don't know how to say that if you're uh, if you speak French please tell me how you meant to pronounce Coretia and Detroit in my Yorkshire accent but that's clearly not how the French would pronounce it so please let me know I am really fascinated by the connection between um, the Holy Grail and the womb and in this section it actually has a how to undertake a grail quest which in both a physical and spiritual way and I just absolutely love that I think that's so interesting and yeah I'm all about it I love um, anything Holy Grail related um, oh, of course the uh, references um, the Da Vinci Code as well in this. Chapter 5 is Skin Turning and Spellcraft, The World of Witches and Warlocks. And this, of course, has a section on Gerald Gardner. 
<laughs> and what I particularly, particularly like about this section is the part that says about the three kinds of witches because I find there's often a lot of confusion when it comes to um, ancient magic, older, you know, magic from a few hundred years ago to thousands of years ago and the people, the victims that were killed in the witch trials in Europe and modern witchcraft. But I think there's a big misconception that probably is because of Margaret Murray and her witch cult in Western Europe, is that what it's called? Which cult in, yeah. But anyway, yeah. He explains it really nicely in this book. And he says, To understand the story of witchcraft in England, we need to look at three different groups of people. Those who practised folk magic up until the early part of the 20th century. So they, you know, that was there was a lot of people doing that. And they wouldn't necessarily call themselves witches just because they practised folk magic. Those who were accused of being witches during the centuries of persecution. So, yeah. And those who began practicing magic that they termed witchcraft in the middle of the 20th century so that would have been like the start of Gardnerian you know kind of around Gar uh, Gerald Gardner's time when modern witchcraft really started to kind of take root so I love that clear distinction between three different types of witches I've got a section on everyone's worst enemy Matthew Hopkins Chapter 6 is called Transmutation and Transformation, The World of the Alchemists and Puffers. And I have to say, this is a section of magic that I've never really been that into. The whole thing with JK Rowling is so annoying because it's, it's kind of the separating the art from the artist thing. And here there's a section called JK Rowling and the Magic of Harry Potter, which in and of itself is fascinating, but now when I hear a name, kind of makes my skin crawl a bit so it's just very annoying but I really enjoy seeing where authors got their inspiration from and in Harry Potter there's so much of it like so much it was incredibly like researched and yeah she got she basically just took things from like so many traditions and there's so much Latin there's so much um, ancient magic and yeah it, it's fascinating actually um, but yeah, such a shame. Anyway, there's a section in here about Philip Pullman, who, as far as I'm aware, hasn't done anything wrong. So let's, yeah, that's, um, that's the winner. Chapter seven is called The Queen's Astrologer, The Man Who Conversed With Angels. And in here, there's a lot about, obviously, astrology. <laughs> we've got all the star signs, we've got a table of correspondences, and yeah, interesting 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 chapter eight is the shag haired wizard of pepper alley cunning folk girdle measurers and the fairy faith oh it's actually all really interesting is this um, section called elves goblins and fairies the magicians packed with fairy charlatans or shamans which kind of goes to show his sensible kind of approach to this uh, the whole magical thing and he's well aware that people can be charlatans Um, it talks about the um, Key of Solomon, High versus Low Magic, and yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Loads of little um, spells, and oh gosh, really, really interesting. I'm getting so carried away. <laughs> um, chapter 9 is called The Eng English Mercury Lover, Freemasonry and the Power of Numbers, and I'm not interested in Freemasons and I'm not interested in numerology either particularly at all but if you are then I'm sure you will find that chapter very interesting I know that's like I'm supposed to be giving like a review of this rather than my own personal opinion but the one thing I did actually find interesting in this section was that it outlines a um, Masonic initiation ritual which I've always, always wondered about. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of love that. And I've had family uh, way, way back, like a not close family, um, but that were in the Masons. And 
I don't know, I do find it kind of interesting for that reason. Chapter 10 is the spirits of dead magicians, secret chiefs, hidden masters, and adepts of the Rosy Cross. So this is all about the Golden Dawn, and it's got, this um, is the chapter that has a section on Christina Oakley Harrington, which is, um, the, who is the founder of Treadwell's, the bookshop in London. So that's really cool and interesting to kind of learn about how she got to that, because owning an occult bookstore would possibly be the best job I can really imagine. <laughs> so yeah, that's really awesome. And the next and um, penultimate chapter is Opening Pandora's Box, The Great Beast and the Priestess of the Sea. And I believe that this is the section, yeah, where we've got um, Dion Fortune and the Rites of Isis, The Risks of the Magical Path, The Magic of Tibet in post-war England, like so interesting. Um, and then a section here called the Yorkshire Yogi and the Last Prosecutions under the Witchcraft Act. And as you can clearly tell from my accent, I am from Yorkshire. So anything about Yorkshire, I am basically interested because we have a maybe slightly misplaced sense of pride here in Yorkshire. We are a bit obsessed with ourselves. <laughs> um, yeah, it's weird. But anything, anything from Yorkshire and I'm interested. I've also got a section on tarot and the 16 tarot personality types and obviously anything to do with tarot I am basically interested to so yeah and then finally we have chapter 12 which is the wizard's return the renaissance of english magic in the 21st century so of course this is all about how magic went from everything that he's been talking about um previously up to now or whenever he finished writing this book so this is the section where he has one of the light text person sections that's actually written by Professor Ronald Hutton who wrote which um, which is a really really good academic book about the history of witches a history of fear from ancient times to the present because he's very matter-of-fact um, an academic in his book I, I really really wanted to know whether he had experience in the occult and so this was a really interesting section to actually to actually read and to just get to know the man behind the book a little bit more so I was really excited when I actually finally saw this and I think this just really rounds it off um, nicely and perfectly shows how we got from then to now and yeah I just this whole book uh, I think it's brilliant if you're interested in magic from an academic point from just a general interest point or from a spiritual one I just I would recommend it to absolutely anybody who even gives the slightest shit about magic and yeah I think I've sold it enough I'm honest like I thought that this was a good one to start with because I do love it so much and there's not too much um, negative to say about it. So don't think that I'm just going to be gushing about every book that I review. Um, most of them are books that I have so I will probably like the majority of them and the point is to inspire you not to just bash books. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's going to be mainly positive but I'm going to be completely honest as well. And I do genuinely think that that's a brilliant book. And yeah, I think that's pretty much everything um, that I wanted to say. Yeah, I think it's a seminal work and I'm really, really happy that I have my own copy that I can scribble in guilt-free. <laughs> so thank you so much for watching and if you've made it to this point, well done. Let me know if there are any more books that you want me to uh, review in the comments. Uh, like the video, subscribe and I'll see you next time.